الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم سوفيزم إن أربك الصوفية أو التصوف الصوفية أو التصوف الصوفية صوفية أو التصوف I don't know which one to use really. A tasawwuf means become, to become a Sufi or to practice Sufism. A Sufiya is the, the sect itself or the beliefs itself. So Sufism in English. For both we can use Sufism. Sufism has entered into Islam. I mean, you ask any Sufi, was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sufi? Straight away they say no. So the first three generations did not know what was Sufism. The Arabic word Suf comes from wool. So the word was known, the word, but nothing to do with the religion or ideology. So the first three generations of Islam, even actually a bit longer, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the year 150 Hijri, so 150 years after him, the Muslims not, never heard of Sufism. From 150, it started slowly creeping into the Muslim world. How? The Muslims who spread Islam from North Africa to China's borders, the first generation were very strong in faith and in Aqidah and creed. They were not influenced by local people's beliefs at all. On the other, on the contrary to that, they converted everybody. Wherever they went, people, the land became Muslim land. The second generation was just as strong, the third as strong, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, my, the best generations of all time is my generation, then the next generation, then the next generation. And as always, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always right. So the first three generations were not influenced by external ideology at all. Even with the wars that happened between them, the first generation, there was no changes to the religion, either in practice or in ideology. Really, no, nothing. After the war between Ali and Muawiyah, things went back as good as during Abu Bakr and Umar time. Not quite, because you cannot reach that stage. But there was no problem, no ideological or dissension problem were men, were, uh, happened for a long time after that. Till the three generations passed, as the Prophet said. Fourth, fifth generation, some people, which is bound, bound to, happen, to happen, were probably listening to other Greek, European, Christian from the West or in the East, Hindu, Buddhist, other beliefs from the Asian uh, culture and the Persians as well. They heard some stories, some theories, some were influenced by it, as simple as this. The influence came that people somehow throughout history, other than Muslims, wanted to make a physical link between them and Allah. This is in all cultures. In the Magian or Zoroastrians of the Persians, <laughs> to the uh, Hindus, to the Buddhists, to the Christians, to the Jews, everybody just wanted to have something physically to do with Allah. They could not grasp that the creator and the creation are separate, are different. Fir'aun said, I am your highest Lord. The Christians said, Jesus is God. The Jews said, uh, Uzair is the son of God. That's when they blasphemed, of course, not when they were following their prophets, they were Muslims. And again, you know, the Hindus have got endless gods. The Buddhists believe that Buddha was a god. So some Muslims came to this, that why not us as well? So this is the problem that some weak Muslims fell into it. And they went to this, uh, to, to cross the borders where they thought that physically there can be contacts with God, right? 
this now the way they started this of course they couldn't say it openly they would be killed straight away right they started softly softly first saying that we are assistics that means we give up voluntarily a lot of the luxuries of this life so one becomes ascetic asistic becomes it means with a lot of self-indulged austerity that we don't drink cold water we uh, live rough life we don't eat good good food we spend all night praying right? this is not islam but but because weak people around them admired their self discipline they became distinguished and then slowly start introducing those ideas of knowledge of the unseen performing miracles and the uh, uh, having contacts with the jinn so they slowly start introducing this so when this became known muslims start now confronting them right in the year about 200 imam shafi noticed that quite a few sufis around now and i tell you now what they call them sufis imam shafi died 204 hijri so they started from the year 150 by the year 200, the 50 years, there were quite a few Sufis around. Imam Shafi'i noticed those people. So he didn't take them very seriously, but he said something which is still valid till today. He said, if someone becomes Sufi by, uh, in the morning, by Zuhur time, he would become an imbecile or an idiot. Right? He noticed them straight away. That's Imam Shafi'i's first reactions about, or comments about them. What is, why they call themselves Sufis? They said to themselves, we must give up all the luxuries of life, even wearing soft clothes. Arabia is a very hot country, whether it is the desert or most Arab countries are Mediterranean hot countries. So they used to wear wool. And the wool in summer is very uncomfort uncomfortable, right? I mean, people wear silk with haram, but then uh, you would wear cotton at that time, which is soft, but no, wool and that's to make life difficult for them. The wool means Suf, the one who wear it, Sufi. That's where Sufi comes from, really. And then by concentrating more on spiritualism, they have less knowledge now of Sharia. So, but till today you find Sufis concentrate more on spiritualism and less knowledge of Islam, less knowledge of Quran, less knowledge of Hadith. Because it's a balance, you broke the, the balance. Three men came to the Prophet ﷺ from outside Medina. They didn't find him in the mosque. They went to his house, knocked on the door. Some of his wives answered. They said to her from behind the door, tell us about the Prophet's worship. She said, well, the hadith doesn't say which wife. She said, he fasts some, some days and he break other days. He prays at night some time and sleeps and he lives normal life so they said oh that's because allah has forgiven all his sins he can afford to do that so one of them said i will fast for the rest of my life other man said i will pray up all night for the rest of my life and the other third man the third one said i will never get married the prophet ﷺ heard this he called for a meeting other than the salah time and he was angry he said, people come to my house and ask, and they get these questions, and it looks like they have belittled my piety. By Allah, I am the most pious amongst you. And I fast and I break fasting, and I pray at night and I sleep, and I marry women. And who doesn't agree with my sunnah, he is not one of me. It's clear, they had to get to be balanced. Anyway, because they moved away now from Sharia and Islamic knowledge, but they needed some sources of knowledge. They have concocted up three ways of knowledge where they get their knowledge to make life easier for them and they cannot be tested. They said, actually, we see Allah, no, we see the Khidr, and the Khidr is a very uh, important personality in Sufism. We see the Khidr, the Khidr is the man that Musa met in the story of the Sul Kahf. And by the way, his, his name is not Khidr. I don't know where they got this name. There is no hadith sahih that says his name was Khidr. And half of the Muslims are called Khidr, Khidr, Khidr. I don't know where they got this name from. Anyway, 
they say the, we see the Khidr or we see the Prophet And personally, he instructs us on our affairs of Iman and Islam and what to do, which is a lie. So they say that we have revelation from either the Prophet or the Khidr. Something you cannot prove them wrong because they, the Khidr will, will not appear to you. You are a common man, but they are special. Anyway, the other thing say that Haddathani Qalbi An Rabbi. My heart tell me that Allah said that. Direct relationship or a, a, a direct inspiration from Allah. That's what they say. I mean, again, how who can prove them wrong? We know they're wrong because they, but they say we my Lord, my heart tell me, but Allah, so this is another source of knowledge. The third source of knowledge is they say we hear sounds in our ears. These sounds comes either from Allah or from the angels or from the jinn or from saints. We hear those sounds, that's for instructions, what to do, what not to do, the, the knowledge of the unseen. We hear them while we are asleep and while we are awake. I cannot prove the first first two or whether they, they do it or not, but I know they, they, don't, they, they don't receive such revelations from the Khidr or the Prophet or from Allah. But the third one has got a medical term called schizophrenia. Uh, people who hear noises in their uh, ears and could be treated with some tablets. Anyway, this is the, th the sources of the Sufi's knowledge, right? The three sources, either Allah or the Prophet or the hear noises. Now, because of this knowledge that they receive, direct special knowledge, and their uh, weak knowledge of Islam, they now start coming, uh, giving in their own interpretation of the Quran and the Hadith. And well, some of them are quite silly, most of them are silly and wrong. For example, Allah said, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Do you remember the surah, we, uh, this ayah we did in Surah Al-Kahf together? And your Lord has ordained or decreed that you should worship none but Him and to be good to your parents. But they say, since Allah ordained that we should worship nothing but, none but by Him, then all worships, all worships are valid because Allah would not have allowed it. Look at this twisted in the, so when Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, Ana Rabbukum al -a that's in the Quran, Allah mentioned that Pharaoh said that, I am your highest Lord, they said Pharaoh was right. Because Allah said you can only worship uh, uh, by his decree. This is how twisted they are, right? And then a lot of people believe them like this. Lot, some people believe them, but not many really. They keep these things to themselves. So this now movement, Sufism starts spreading in the Muslim world, especially the more ignorant people became because the first few generations were all almost scholars. Then for the next four or five, well, about two, a few hundred years, Muslim knowledge spread a lot, and then Muslims went to decline in everything, political, military, and knowledge. It's all, I mean, this is the cycle of life, really. Every nation got to go through it. During that third cycle, from the year about 600 Hijri onwards, Sufism spread a lot in the Muslim world, right? The Sufis from that time till our time now are divided into three levels of Sufism. They're not all the same. There's three levels of them. Let's start with the third level. The third level of Sufism are, and that's the majority of Muslims who are Sufis, and a lot of Muslims are Sufis nowadays. All there are less Sufis now than they were 50 years ago or 100 years ago, due to Muslims becoming educated and thinking and asking. But anyway, in the past about 100 years, probably most Muslims were Sufis from Morocco to Indonesia. The third level of Sufism which the majority of Muslims, uh, the Muslims that you see in the mosques, they pray like according to the Sunnah, their Hajj, their Zakah. Uh, there's nothing wrong with their practice of Islam. But they call themselves Sufis because their Imam probably forced them somehow to believe in some peer, some holy man back home, and they give him bay'ah, allegiance, and they give him some cash with it as well. But you don't, and they do probably one, one more thing. They do the zikr, 
not all of them. Few of them come and do communal zikr. Remember Allah by getting together and making zikr. So those the majorities of Muslims, which is we have no problem with them other than these little things which we can overlook. Because their aqidah, nothing wrong with their aqidah, right? Uh, they have one or two practices wrong, wrong and that's giving bay'ah to the wrong man. And this bay'ah does not entail anything. I mean, they don't go and fight for him. They don't worship him to that peer. Uh, just this, this, that's what he wanted, respect and some cash with it, really. Right? And they do this so the bay'ah and the zikr. A lot of Muslims that you see them as from Morocco, Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from whatever it is, uh, Malaysia, a lot of Muslim Sufis are like this. As I said, they, we don't have problem with them. They don't have problem with other Muslims. This is level three of Muslims, Sufis. The second level now are those peers who call themselves peers. Those who call themselves peers, peers means is an, an Urdu word which means a holy man. Uh, they use an English holy man, they use an Urdu peer, they use an Arabic wali. Wali means, so that's the term that they found nearest to them. Wali means, uh, if we'll come to it, Islamic term. Wali means a friend of Allah. It has many meanings. But Allah defined who are his friends. You see, in other religions, when you have saints, that's the word I was looking for in English as well, other than holy man, saints. Other religions have saints, all religions. Those saints and other religions are either self-appointed or appointed by their friends just before they passed away, right? They appoint them as saints, as someone, saints means muqaddas, holy man. Not Allah. In Islam, we don't have clergy to start with, to appoint anybody, and we don't have sainthood. The so Pope, who are the walis of Allah in Islam? Sheikh, yes? The Pope, the Pope makes saints after 50 years they've died, 200 years they've died, irregularly, makes new saints yes true true they appoint them post-mortem after they died yes, yes hundreds of years, they, they do that yes and sometimes they kill somebody and they regret it after 50 years 100 years and then they make him saint yeah. they've done that yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, let's say now awliya the wali is singular awliya is plural the awliya in, in in the quran are mentioned who are the walis of allah the friends of allah Allah said in Surah Yunus, Allah inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Definitely, the awliya of Allah, they have nothing to fear or to grieve on. And then he defines him, Alladina amanu wa kanu yattakun. Those who believe and fear Allah. This is the wali in Islam. Every Muslim who fears Allah, who is a believer, and fears Allah is a wali. We don't have from Abu Bakr's time till the day of judgment, anyone that could be appointed are you are the wali of Allah, right? We can. Awliya Allah, why is that? Because according to this definition, those who believe and they fear Allah. And the problem with us other than the prophets, we cannot be at one level of Iman all the time. The Iman of all human beings, except the Prophets, goes up and down. Even during the Prophet time, the Sahaba said, we noticed that, and the Prophet said, I know that. Our Iman is not steady. It doesn't mean it's, it's, they go to Kufr, but it's not at the same level. Then this, this, let me explain this fully, so it won't cause any confusion. The Sahaba said to the Prophet وسلم, Messenger of Allah, when we are in your company, we feel our faith is very high. When we go back to our women and children and families, we feel our Iman is not as good. Why is that? The Prophet ﷺ said, if your Iman, when you are with your families, like it is when, when you were with me, then the angels will come down in the streets and shake hands with you and enter your houses, as, or as the Prophet ﷺ said, right? So this is 
Okay, so when your iman is good, and most Muslims pass through this, probably all Muslims pass through this feeling, a rush of iman and faith and love to Allah and his prophet and devotion. At that time, you are a of Allah. I don't need to be appointed in the mosque or by anybody. Right? So these are the worries of, of Allah, right? And then we'll talk about what they do from... Uh, what further take it we'll take a commercial break now for a few minutes we'll, I've got, got some video to show you what the Sufis have done to the Muslim world okay so let's share the screen and about two or three minutes Bismillah can you see the screen yes That is in Africa. Muslim Sufis in Africa is practicing. I don't know what they're practicing. I don't know. Where is that? This young man has got a snake on his tongue. To start with. Amazing. Yeah. Now they are planting knives in his head. I don't know that you can see it or not. I don't know why it stopped. Yes, yes, we can see that. Yeah, yeah. Look, look. They planted so many knives in his head. And he's showing off what's happening now. Okay. Can't them. These are now from the, that's al This is the Chechen Muslims. Tens of thousands of them, look what they do. And you see this in many mosques as well. As well, really. Right? Is that Kadiro? Now, this guy here. Every time he kisses his hand, he puts him some bank banknotes, non stop. <laughs> He's reading an ayah from the Quran. Many of the rabbis and priests they devour people's money in haram ways. Now, this is a fourth type of Sufi, which is very strange, but believe me, they exist. I'm that's a Sufi guy, and he's an author of Islamic books. Is that Harun Yahya? Harun Yahya. <laughs> Look at him. He went back to, to Turkey, and we'll see what Erdogan has done to him. He's in Turkey now. He's a follower of Abdullah Golan, the one who did the... Uh, Kuba gets Erdogan. Here's him, handcuffed to the prison. He made he made uh, many good documentaries, Harun Yahya. I mean, they show even show in Islam Channel and other places. Uh, is, is, he made very good documentaries, Harun Yahya. If it's the same guy, he is he is unfortunate. Yes, anyway. So anyway. now the Sufis are associated with something called karamat. A lot of those peers now and in the past claim to be able to do uh, supernatural work. Uh, a lot of them claim in the past and they did, right? And these supernaturals, I mean, they did a lot of them really. They, they do manage to do this. What's these supernaturals? We do not deny the existence of supernatural works in Islam. We don't deny this because the Quran tells us a lot about them. The supernaturals in Islam are divided into seven categories. Four of them are good and true, and three of them are false and haram. 
the four good ones are the supernatural or the karamat, which is what happens, what's, or, or mu'ajiza, which means uh, ayah, many names it has. And let's call it the supernatural. What happened to the prophets before they are appointed? Or the, before they were appointed? Like Isa alayhi salam spoke when he was a baby. Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam said, before I became prophet, I used to pass by a stone who used to give me salam. Prophet Musa as well, that his mother threw him in the big Nile and ended up in the room of, uh, what's his name, uh, Pharaoh. Okay, so these are, prophets have no say in it and they just happen to them. So the well, first type of supernatural is what happened to the prophets before are they appointed. The second is what happens during the prophethood time. These things that they don't claim they're doing it, they claim that Allah has done them through them. So this Allah is doing it, doing the, 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 these ones, like all the miracles of Musa alayhi salam, nine miracles, the stick, the, the hand, the, the crossing of the rivers, the, the blood, etc. It's nine miracles that for Musa alayhi salam. The Prophet salam had few miracles, it happened a few times that his army were either very thirsty or starving and a little bit of food was enough for all of them. Prophet Muhammad's uh, uh, miracles were different than other prophet miracles in a way that the other prophet's miracles were to show the kafirs. While Prophet Muhammad's miracle was to show the Muslims. Why is that? Because the miracles or supernaturals with the passage of time, they lose their power. Now, if you tell somebody that Jesus gave death, uh, gave life to the dead, it won't uh, make someone Christian, right? If you tell him Prophet Muhammad gave so much food to people, it won't make someone Muslim. So when people ask, and that's Allah mentioned in the Quran, they say, when they ask you about a miracle, say, it's enough for you the Quran, an everlasting miracle, an intellectual miracle that's everlasting. You cannot show the Bible. The Bible will not make anyone believe now, unless you force them to hunger or some, anyway, it's hardly anyone willingly become Christian or a Jew or anything, but there's the Quran, right? So, so the second one is the prophet's miracles, the prophets before the prophethood. And the third one is what happened to the good Muslims. Sometimes not they performing it, it happens to them. A lot of Mujahideen saw a lot of miracles happen in the battlefield. Uh, some good people, something happened to him. If a Muslim claims he can't do it, he is lying. He can't. It happens on his hand. Allah helps him out somehow. And a generosity from Allah. We call it karama from Allah. Right? So this is the third one. The fourth one is some supernatural happen to Muslims, good Muslims and not good Muslims, even non-Muslims. Sometimes something happened that they couldn't explain. Rarely, but it happens. Really, believe me, it happened to Muslim, non-Muslims. And we have no explanation for that. If it happens to you without you asking for it, I mean, for example, someone was about to go in an airplane and somehow he changes his mind. And then there's an airplane falls off or destroyed or something. Says, oh, thanks God, I wasn't on it. Right? Or sometimes somebody falls from an airplane, everybody dies except a baby or something. So these types of cannot be explained, this is from Allah, and it's accepted as good things. Now this is the four things which are good ones. Before prophethood, the prophets, to the good Muslims, and to everybody. Supernatural, that have no side effects, no evil effects, no bad intentions, that's all from Allah. The other three ones that comes, and this so some so we use them, the other three bad ones that come, the first one is what we call the work of the fortune tellers. Fortune tellers, they tell you something that is, is impossible for you to know, for them to, to have known naturally. They tell you what you've left in your home, what's in your pocket, or they perform something from the front of you, or they fly. A lot of Sufis and non-Muslims do this as well. This is mostly the work of jinn. That's why it looks supernatural. You don't see the jinn, 
I mean, like what we saw now, these boys are planting knives in his head and others, there are many in their YouTube, they put a knife in his eye, two knives in his eyes. And another put uh, a, a spear in his uh, chest and comes out from his back. This is the work of jinn. You cannot do it. And when all, all these operations, not a single blood, uh, drop of blood comes out from him, right? So this is the work of jinn, right? As well as telling you the unseen, this is called the fortune tellers. The other thing is uh, astrology. Astrology is some people can tell you about your luck or what's going to happen by comparing your date of birth uh, with the stars. Some non-Muslims did studies on a million, half a million case, and they found it was all lies. But I'll tell you why people believe it. Aisha radiallahu anha said to the Messenger of Allah, said, Messenger of Allah, in Jahiliya, before Islam, we used to go to fortune tellers. I know we talk about uh, astrology, but they, they, they work in the same, knowing, talking about the unseen, the astrologist and the fortune tellers but in different ways. One used the jinn, one used the stars. But they all talk about the unseen. Said so we used to go to the fortune tellers and we found that they tell us the truth sometimes. How come? Very frank question from Aisha to the Prophet The Prophet said, this is a jinn sometimes steals the news that's coming from heaven to earth and add to it a hundred lie and give it to his agent in the human the human agent and the human agent mentioned the hundred lies now why people believe them when they are saying one truth out of a 99 uh, out of a hundred lies and actually i've tried this with other people that who had come across it. A fortune teller or a peer who knows the future or anyone who can tell you the future, whoever his job is or astrologer, when he tells you a hundred nonsense and one of them is truth, you only believe the truth and you forget everything else. Right? You understand? This impresses you so much that you psychologically overlook all the other 199 lies. You yourself. But if you list what, if you record and say he lied here, he lied here, he lied here, he lied here, he only got one right, and most of the time they get it right by uh, coincidence, right? So three types of evil, uh, we said, three types of, of evil uh, supernaturals. One of them, the fortune teller, one is the astrologer, and the third one is the magic, black magic. It's black magic and white magic, and they're both magic. The white magic is what wipes out the black magic, according to Western culture. But they're both magic, and they're both bad. But the, the black magic, or the magic, this is mentioned in the Quran. Allah said that uh, there were magicians during Musa time, and he said they made people they, uh, they affected people's vision, and when people saw what happened, they believed that they were snakes. But even Musa, I believe that as well. He saw, he's because he got frightened. Allah said to him, don't be afraid, you will overcome them, right? Because suddenly in front of him, he saw snakes. How this magic work is, I couldn't understand it. I've tried a lot. It's different than anything else. Not the work of the jinn, it's different ways. It needs special research, right? So, but then if any Muslim does something good and miraculous, first the condition, he should never claim that he, he can do it. It just happened to him from Allah. He cannot say I'm doing it again and he cannot give the credit to himself. And mostly accidental, right? Now coming back to these Sufis now, we're talking about Sufis. So they believe that in their saints, and their saints have gone so far by saying that our saints have gone further than the prophets, even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Some of them said Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was God. He was so close to God that he became God. Some of them they said 
we are not looking forward to go to paradise. To go to paradise is weakness. To fear from hell is weakness. We only be want to be with Allah, the liars, right? Without knowing even how to pray or to fight or something. And a lot of them as well as said, they see the other claim, and I met someone who said to me that his sheikh, some, a lot of them claim they say the, the khadr frequently. One of them said, my sheikh sees the prophet 24 hours a day. He's right in front, while he's awake, he sees the prophet. I don't know that. Now, a lot of these as well, we see them that they call them Sufis, they become what they call Majdub. In Urdu word as well, Majdub means attracted. Attracted by whom? By Allah. When you see someone Majdub, usually his clothes are dirty, his face is dirty, his hair is untidy, and people they just respect him, they say he's Majdub. And when this Majdub, they do say a lot of strange things and some stupid people believe them and some people believe them like i'll give you examples of what they claim not this majub these peers that one one of these majubas in particular he was mocked by children children were laughing at him because of his shave and probably dirty so he said to them he called the angel of death Jibri, uh, J no Jibreel, the messenger of allah Angel of Death is, has no name in Islam, but the Muslims call him like the Jews, Israel, which is not his true name, as the Jews called him that. But in Islam, we don't have his name. Called the Malik al Maut. So this Sufi Sab, he called the, the Angel of Death and said, you kill those boys or I'm going to sack you. And people believed him. So they all ran away, right? Another one says that one of the peers, one of the saints, made a wudu, prayed and slept for 17 years. And when he woke up without making wudu, straight away went to pray. No, that's one of these nonsense. One of them said that one Sufi spent 40 years without food and drink. And people believe it, 40 years, okay? Two men, in a few stories, Sufi says, two men claim to be Allah, God. That's in somewhere in Arabian history. So they went to the governor. They took him to the governor. They said, they claim to be God. Are you God? Yes. Into Allah? Yes. Into Allah? Yes. So he said, lock them up in a room which has no, uh, and block the windows and the doors. If they make it out, then they are gods. If they don't, then they are not. <laughs> so after few, one week or 10 days, they, oh, they broke the wall because they built up the wall. They, they broke up the wall. They found one room was empty. And the other room, the man was dead. <laughs> How the other man get out? I don't know, but he never showed up, right? Right. Now, coming back to level one Sufism, that's a big problem, really. Level one Sufism, we talk about level three, which are the ordinary Muslims, and level two. Level two are those peers. But those peers, some of them, elevate to a higher level also when we said at the beginning and that is uniting with allah like ibn arabi one of the most famous sufi beer ever he says uh, when i look at my shirt i can only see allah there is only allah in my shirt right one of them called abu yazid al-bastami again abu yazid al-bastami again one of the most famous Peer or uh, Sufi, he said, Subhani, Subhani, Ma A'adham Shani, Glory be to me, Glory be to me, how great I am. <laughs> that's that's cover, right? The way they unite with Allah, or they claim, the liars, they unite with Allah, they have come up with four theories how to unite with Allah. Those Sufis throughout the history. Four ways. I mean, it's a lot of research until I found all these ways. I've heard about them in the past, but anyway, I gather them together. Four ways they say that we unite with Allah. And every tariqa, every people have got their own ways of uniting with Allah. One of them, like Ibn Arabi, is one that is subhan, uh, there is nothing in the, in, the, in the tube other than Allah. One of them, he said, solution with Allah. That means Allah comes down and dissolves in him and he becomes God. Where did he get this from? From Christianity. 
the Christians say the same, that Allah came down and dissolved in the body of Jesus. That's why they say Jesus become God, right? And they didn't tell us how he became the third one, which is the Holy Ghost. But they always talk about Allah and Jesus. So this is one way as God coming down and dissolving in a human being. That's one way. The other way is the way of Abu Yazid al-Bustami. He says, you can elevate in faith till you go up and join Allah and you become one with him. So what the first one is tihad with Allah, so a resolution with Allah. The second one is called al-hulul, means you join Allah. The first one, Allah joins you. It's all the same nonsense, like, but this is the two ways of their uh, ways of uniting with Allah. The third way of uniting with Allah, and that's the way of the Naqshbandi. A lot of people, most Naqshbandis out there, probably the biggest Sufi groups, ordinary people don't know that, but their peers, they do that, even in their books. The third way is Wahdatul Wujud, the unity of the universe. Probably all heard about this, Wahdatul Wujud. So we don't talk about the unity of Allah, this is haram the oneness of Allah. What the unity of the universe, that means all the universe is one. And that's Allah. How? Once, when I know a friend of mine, an English convert, I've known him more than 40 years now. He's from London. We meet every so many years, somehow. And he was one of those from Naqshbandi, from Sheikh Nazim. You know Nazim, the Kub from Kubras, from Cyprus? Mm -hmm. He yeah. is the one that believes in this Wahdatul Wujud. So this friend of mine, his name is Muhammad Lameen. One day, last time I met him, probably about 10, 10, 12 years ago, I said, do you believe in Wahdatul Wujud? He said, yes. He said, explain it to me. Nobody explained it to me before. He's got a degree in physics, so he's educated. He's about my age. Right, so he's not a young man, he knows what he's talking about. He's been Sufi, following Sheikh Nazim, probably since he became Muslim some 40 years ago. I said, explain it to me, what is Wahdat al-Wujud? As I said, I'm talking with an educated Muslim, not affected by third world culture or ignorance. He accepted Islam voluntarily, but this Sheikh Nazim convinced him about Wahdat al-Wujud. He said, explain it to me. He said, Wahdat al-Wujud is Everything that Allah has created is a manifestation of Allah. Like we, human being, we can hear, we can see, Allah can hear, he can see. Of course, not to the same level, but to a minute level, we have some qualities of Allah. So we are manifestation of God. And if you, he's a scientist, this God guy, he said, if you put two, two mirrors in front of you, and it changed the angle between them, the number of images increase or decrease till it, when the, uh, the, the mirrors are parallel, then you get infinite number of images, which is everybody knows this fact. He said, and that's how Allah's creation, infinite number of images of God. I said, so everything God created is an image of his? He said, yes. I said, can I repeat this one more time, please? And I want to hear from you, yes. Everything God created is an image of God. He said, yes. I said, including shaitan? He said, no. I said, who, who created shaitan then? He said, I don't know. I said, well, your theory destroyed me. <laughs> right? Because he couldn't say shaitan and Allah the same, could he? Honestly. I, I thought he would become reasonable and say, ashhadu an la ilaha Allah, shalom rasulullah. I said, one question your theory destroyed, what can I do for you? Right? Okay. Now, with the next few minutes, 10 minutes, we'll talk about different groups of Sufism. That's what probably we're all looking forward to hear about. <laughs> Everybody wants to hear about his own group. <laughs> but I'll have to be frank. I mean, and then I'm always well, uh, open to people prove me wrong. And so, no, no. What is our group? Sorry? What is our group called? <laughs> Well, okay, the, the floor is open to you. Anyway, let's talk about the most famous, I mean, there are many of them, by the way. There are more than 200 tariqas. What tariqa means? Every sheikh 
he wants to have, they call them sheikh or wali or peer, want to have his own group. And there's competition between them. And sometimes they break up to, because to become a sheikh, if your sheikh is going to appoint somebody else, then you break up and make your own tariqah. Tariqah is a way of making zikr, like we see those uh, Chechens have got different ways than others who jump up and down or others who bang their heads. There's different ways of making zikr and different set of beliefs. It keeps breaking up. The most, you know, there are many uh, 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 groups. One of them is Al-Qadriya. Qadriya is, uh, they say, which is not true, that Abdul Qadir Al-Jilani in Baghdad, he, he made this thing. He died about 500 Hijri after the Prophet 561 Hijri. So Abdul Qadir Al-Jilani, his name is, was Abdul Qadir Al-Jilani, and believe me, when you read his true history, biography, he was never Sufi. But they called, they made him Sufi like they made Isa, whatever they made him. They have two names, his Khatariqa. Either Jailani or Qadiriya. They're the same. Either you use his first name or you use his second name. Then there is uh, al Rifa'iya, al Akbariya, Muhammad ibn Arabi, al Mawlawiya. Al Mawlawiya is the ones who make the wheel dancing in Turkey. You know, I've seen those wheel dancing in Turkey. Yeah. That's what Mawlawiya. There's a Naqshabindiya. Naqshabindiya is that, like what we talked about, this Sheikh Nazim. I mean, I've read on Sheikh Nazim's, by the way, uh, website. He described himself, why he's different. He said, holy men before me, before him, used to give people's needs, daily needs, material needs. I give them their spiritual needs. Because he couldn't say daily needs like others, because we say, we could lend me some money then, isn't it? The spiritual need, or you can have as much spirit as you want to. Right? So there's the Maksabin, and a lot of these groups really deal with that, make their, the, the founder as super beings who perform miracles, other gave life to the dead, and the stories are endless, fantastic stories. And then there is the Brailwees, that people want to know about the Brailwees. Yes. What's the difference between Brailweeism and others? Brailwees, originally they were Qadriya, right? Muhammad Reza Khan, he established it and he died about the beginning of the 20th century. Brailwe is a village in India. A village, yes. yes. So is Dobang. Dobang is a village in India. Dobangis are started from there as well. Yes, but, but the Brailwism is the name of the tariqa. Yeah, it's from the, the, by, the town, yes. Started by it's Ahmed Raza Khan. Sorry? You started by Ahmed Raza Khan. Yes, but I mean, his tariqa is not different than other tariqas, to be honest, so that to mention. They all have got the Superman. So, but what he slightly made different things, and instead of saying me about himself or the other uh, peers before, before him, they were number one. He made the prophet number one. He said, uh, that's in Wikipedia you find it. Nothing to do with Muslim. Reference to him. He said, addressing the messenger of Allah, I don't know the difference between you and Allah. I will find out in the day of judgment, but I don't know. Right? So he thinks that the prophet and Allah are the same. While the others, like Ibn Arabi, he thinks he is an Allah the same. And others think that he is Allah. So they have got a problem, always, I said, this connection with Allah. But to be honest, when you meet 99% of the bravery, etc., they don't believe that. And they don't, that's why I'm saying they are ordinary Muslims, you pray behind them, you pray behind you, there's nothing wrong. So we don't want to make a war with those simple people there. But if a big guy is come, we'll ask him. But this is in their books. That is, the Prophet and Allah are almost the same. That's what they claim, right? I think this is what I have prepared for you. Okay, what's the finally? Uh, there is a, a man called Ibn al Jawzi, who died about some 600 years ago. He wrote a book called The Devil's Deceptions. He talked a lot about the tricks, how the Sufis trick the normal people, right? Ibn Taymiyyah was one of their worst enemies. He exposed them badly, really. He wrote a lot about them. He was very harsh on them. I'm talking about other scholars. Uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he said, if you, if you see Sufis, 
talking about those original Sufis, there it wasn't spread at that time. Only the, the sheikhs of the Sufis did. You don't sit with him, you don't sit with him, just keep away from him, right? This is some of the, and we told you what the Shafi'i said, that if Sufi becomes, if Sufi in the beginning of the day, by midday he will become a fool. Now, Sufism today, finally, is a lot of exploitation of the poor people. They come, they visit these peers, that's number two, not the third, the top one, you don't see them anymore. But the number two, the ones, they visit people and they exploit them badly, take a lot of money from them, a uh, lot of uh, prestige, etc. It's become business. I mean, if you go and see, there's Ajmir Sharif, this is called Ajmir Sharif, where a lot of these people who are stabbing themselves and poking knives in their faces and their heads, and then uh, a lot of companies there that they facilitate the visits, etc. It's all a lot of business, really, and a lot of corruptions in it. But in general, if we go to number one and part of number two, there is shirk, definitely shirk association with Allah, right? A lot of these practices are very common with the Shia practices as well, unfortunately. The Shias have a lot of gatherings, again, respect for few people. And finally, a lot of those peers write what they call ta'weez, which is ta'weez means... Uh, Amulet. Amulet, amulet that people carry on, carry on their on their body, and it's got something to protect you, and that is shirk. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Whoever relies on ta'weez, then he has belied what I have been sent with." This is Sufism in brief. Next week, inshallah, we'll talk about something different, and we'll talk about. I was thinking, going to talk about Salafis and Wahhabis. Yeah. I'll try, but let's talk about the first imams first, how the evolution of fiqh, how the first imam came, because the Salafi came after that. I might do it all in one, all together, all the, all the mazhab, including the Salafis and the Wahhabis next week.